recap. I mentioned last week that I believe I spoke for all of us when I said that we all have this hope that we all want to be participants of this great event. Amen? Amen. I said last week that I believe I speak for all of us when I said that we all would like to be able to know that we are going to enjoy an eternal life of bliss and happiness with God. Well, I asked a very important question last week, and that was, how? How do we achieve this? How do we achieve salvation? And this brought us to our scripture reading two weeks ago and this morning. And that's John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So how is it that we get to obtain eternal life? Right here. Getting to know God. And last week, we covered that the way in which we get to know God is two ways. We do it by the study of the Word of God and through a diligent, active life of prayer. So, you guys remember, that's what we covered last week. A, life, a devotional life, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The study of His Word and prayer. That is what gets us to be able to get to know Him. So, what's stopping us? Well, this is kind of where we left off last week. Remember that we covered Romans 8, 7? The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. We studied that according to God's word, I said something that was kind of controversial, that is that by nature, what? We hate God. By nature, we hate God. God. Now, every time I say that, whenever someone hears it for the first time, they're like, oh, 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 I don't hate God. I already gave you many examples proving that Romans 8, 7 does not lie. That the carnal mind is, in fact, enmity against God. I gave you guys several examples of what would we really, carnally, with the flesh, choose? To spend hours upon hours with God? Or to spend hours on Netflix, or on the cell phone, or out having fun with friends? And we all were able to answer that internally, and we know what the answer is. This is why I share with you one of my personal favorite Bible texts, because it gives me so much motivation to continue and press on. And that's when Paul says in Romans 7, 14 through 16, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. Now remember, this was Apostle Paul speaking, one of the greatest men in the New Testament, the greatest man outside of Jesus, wrote most of the New Testament, and where was he at years after being the Apostle Paul? Well, this is what he sounded like. Oh man, I don't get this. That which I want to do, I end up not doing. And that which I don't want to do, which I know is wrong, that's what I end up doing. And I ask you, how many of you guys can relate to this? I believe all of us can. We can all relate to the fact that we know what we want to do because we know intellectually what is right and wrong. We have that discernment, but we just don't do it. And yet, what we don't want to do, what we know is wrong, what we know displeases God, that is what we always end up doing. Well, remember, I gave you guys another answer found in the spirit of prophecy, where the spirit of prophecy says that the mind that is earthly finds no pleasure in contemplating the word of God. That is that simple. The earthly mind cannot find pleasure in contemplating God. But then I ask, so what is the solution? And the solution comes with what she says next. But for the mind renewed by the Holy Spirit, then what? Divine beauty and celestial light shine from its sacred pages. So the renewed mind by the Holy Spirit is what begins to give us a different perspective. We begin to see Jesus Christ through a different lens. Now, how do we have our mind renewed by the Holy Spirit? Because we just read that this is the only way. Having our minds renewed by the Holy Spirit is the only way that we're going to be able to actually enjoy 
and get a blessing out of contemplating God's Word. So how do we do this? Well, that's what leads us now to part two. How to study the Bible, part two. Remember that we covered that the sad part is that even though we now understand why, remember two weeks ago we covered why the Christian life is so difficult. Remember, because we try to live our lives like if we were in love when we're not. Remember we covered that. So this is why we've understood the importance of doing this, but this is where we're at. How do I study the Bible? When I kneel up to pray, I don't even know what to say. How, how, do I, how do I read this book? How do I get something out of it? When I pray, well, what do I say? And we end up in the corner of unsure, lost, baffled, confused. <laughs> and um, I don't get this. And eventually, <laughs> never recover this. This is the typical road that we go down. Now, I mentioned something very important two weeks ago. And that is, there is a huge difference between reading your Bible and studying your Bible. Black and white difference. I have compared it in an analogy that reading your Bible is like raking the leaves. But studying your Bible is like going deep into the ground and digging deep inside. Remember, where, where do you find the gold and the diamonds and the jewels? Raking leaves? Anybody ever found diamonds raking leaves? But you've got to dig deep for that. Well, to find the jewels that God has for us in His Word, we're not going to get it just reading it. We need to study it. Remember that I shared with you, Spirit of Prophecy, our physical life is sustained by food, so our spiritual life is sustained by the Word of God. And look at this, every soul is to receive life from God's Word for himself. As we must eat for ourselves in order to receive nourishment, we must also, so we must receive the Word for ourselves. We are not to obtain it merely through the medium of another's mind. See, what you're doing right now is you are receiving the Word of God, but through the medium of another mind. Mind. The pastor is preaching to you the Word of God. Now that's a good thing. It can help, but that is not the way God expects you to get to know Him. And I'll tell you right now, you will not get to know Jesus Christ and have an intimate, personal relationship with Him coming to church every week. You can come to church every single week and hear sermons every single week. That is not going to get you to know who God is. It's going to get you to know about God. Oh, you're going to learn plenty of Him, but you will not know Him until you do it yourself. That's why I shudder when I see parents that expect Sabbath school to teach their children the Bible. Parents that expect the church to train up their children in the way they should go. Parents that even spend money every month taking their kids to a Christian school, expecting the teachers to do their job. No, folks, the Lord made it clear in His Word, we are in charge of feeding ourselves the Word of God. And as parents, we are the ones that must bring up our children in the path of God. Others can help, but it is our duty and our responsibility. All right. So, where we actually left off last week is we said we're going to look at the why, when, where, and how to study God's Word. When we understand these three W's in an H, why, when, where, and how, things are going to become a lot more clear. Let's look at the first one. Why? Why should we study the Word of God? Well, folks, what is our primary goal? Again, our ultimate destination as Christians. What is our ultimate goal? 
Eternal life, heaven, to be saved. Amen? And who is the only one who can get us there? Jesus Christ. Right? We just established our number one goal is heaven, eternal life. And the only one that can get us there is Jesus Christ. Now we're studying why should we study the Bible. Check this out. John 6, 51. This is Jesus talking. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 16, 30 and 31. What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So according to John 6, 51, John 14, 6, and Acts 16, 30 and 31, who is the one that gets us into heaven? Jesus Christ. And when we take this into consideration, why should we study the Bible? John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, says Jesus Christ. Why should we study the Bible? Because we find Jesus Christ in the Bible. And Jesus Christ is the only one that can get us to where our destination lies. We all just agree that the, the number one destination for a Christian is heaven, salvation, eternal life. And we just established the only one that can get us there is Jesus Christ. And why do we search the scriptures? Because we just saw, search the scriptures, for in them you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures is what testify of Jesus Christ. The scriptures is where we find the key to heaven. Amen? Amen. Do we understand this? Let's continue seeing why should we study the Bible. Folks, what is the only thing that will take us to hell? What is the only thing that will cause us to be lost? One word, three letters. Sin. Sin is what will give us the complete opposite of salvation. Damnation. Being lost. Now why should we study the Bible? Psalms 119.11 Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So why, again, should we study the Word of God? Because in the Word of God, as we hide it in our hearts, we will not sin against God. That which takes us to damnation. You see, I just gave you a reason biblically why we should read the Bible. Because that's where we find Jesus Christ, the key to heaven. But why else should we read the Bible? Because when we hide it in our heart, we will not sin, which is what keeps us from heaven. Do we understand? Alright. Continuing on. Why should we study the Word of God? Anybody here want to be smart? How many people here would like to be stupid? No way? We all want to be intelligent, right? Did you guys know this? Spirit of prophecy tells us clearly, check this out. If medical students will study the Word of God diligently, they will be far better prepared to understand their other studies. For enlightenment always comes from an earnest study of the Word of God. Nothing else will so help to give them a retentive memory as a study of the scriptures. Did you guys know that? That studying the Bible enhances your brain. Studying the Bible enhances your ability to retain memory. Your academics will improve. Your job will improve. Anything where you're using your mind, the studying of the Word of God diligently prepares the mind to understand other studies. So just yet another reason as to why we should study the Word of God. Now, another reason why. Now I'm going to play a clip for you here. Hopefully this works. 
if you can maybe help set it up here. I don't know how many of you have seen um, the uh, the movie Fireproof. So many of show of hands, how many of you have seen the movie Fireproof? If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's a very powerful Christian movie. But I want to play for you just a little clip. The movie Fireproof has to do about basically marriage and your commitment to your spouse based on biblical principle. And we are seeing in this clip that I'm about to show you, we're going to see... Um, is it ready? Okay. We're going to see a clip where the husband is ready to give up, is ready to divorce his wife. He's been trying and trying and trying because in the movie, the father tells him, I think I can help you save your marriage. And the father begins to give him counsel, things to do. Start living for her. Don't be selfish. Think about her. Do that. And the husband tries for a while. And he's doing everything in his power to please the wife. But it looks at this point of the movie like it's not availing too much. Because the wife still continues to ignore him, blah, blah, blah. So he's ready to quit. He's like, Dad, I don't want to do this anymore. I want a divorce. And then the father begins to say, you know, I'll tell you what the problem is, son. You have been doing everything on your own. And of course, here the husband's like, oh, come on, Dad. Don't, don't start with this Jesus stuff. I, I don't need God for my marriage to work. Okay, I'm just going to play this bit. Just listen to this. It's a, about a three minute clip. But again, we're answering the question, why should we study the Word of God? Because I believe in this clip, we see another reason why.
for what I did. Jesus Christ changed my life. That's when I truly began to love your mom. So I can't say this for you. This is between you and me. But I love you too much not to tell you the truth. Can't you see me? Were you guys able to hear it and understand it? Those in the world? <clears throat> what we are seeing here in this clip. You heard him talking about how I did this for her, I did that for her, I did this for her. How can I continue to show love over and over and over to somebody that continually rejects me? And then you see his father leaning on the cross. This is exactly what each and every one of us are doing every time we are not reaching out to spend time with Him, to study His Word. He is constantly showing us love, blessings upon blessings upon blessings, over and over and over. And what are we doing in return? So, another reason why we should study God's Word is because of the simple fact that every single day, God is spending time with us. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we are alive today because God gives us the privilege to take another breath. We are alive right now because God allows our heart to take the next beat. He is spending time with us every day. So shouldn't we, in gratitude, spend a little bit of time with Him to get to know Him? After all, getting to know Him is eternal life. Continuing on why we should study God's Word. In a nutshell, I don't know how many of you guys remember Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. What Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says is deep. Many will say to me on that day, this is Jesus Christ talking, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done so many wonderful works. <clears throat> On this day, you're going to have deacons, elders, Bible workers, pastors, head pastors, senior pastors, president of conferences that are going to be saying, Lord! And then will I profess unto them. What's Jesus going to say? I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Do you see how it all comes back again to knowing God? We can spend all our time going to church every single week. We can spend all our time giving Bible studies. We can spend all our time feeding the homeless. We can spend all our time going and doing missionary work and building churches and doing all kinds of wonderful things. If we don't know God, He will say, Depart from me. I never knew you, you that work iniquity. And what is iniquity? Sin. I told you guys last week, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, there are those who have been in the church for 30, 40, 50, 60 years that know all about God. Can break down the 2300 day prophecy? 
can break down the 1,260 years, can break down the 70 week prophecy, can break down the 144,000, can break down the three angels messages, can totally break down Daniel and Revelation. They know all about God, but they do not know Him. Do you know what it's going to be like for God to tell somebody who's been in the church for 60, 70 years, who has given more Bible studies than a calculator can count, that can break down Daniel and Revelation in the whole word, and God tell him, I don't know you. Well, you know what? 
when talking about how they must destroy these aliens. Do you know? I saw this, you can Google it. They're all together in the brief room, in, in the briefing room. All the soldiers, all the human beings that have given themselves to be warriors to destroy these aliens. You've got specialists that come in and say, you all hopefully have said goodbye to your families because the chances of you going back to your family is slim to none. These aliens are the terror of the world. They are the enemies of mankind in every way, shape, and form. And there is Chris Pratt with other human beings learning about these aliens to take them out. And I kid you not, in this film, one of the specialists says now, our only chance to get these enemies of the world is the following. These aliens come out and attack six days of the week. Six days they work havoc on the planet. But then on the seventh day they go back into their caves. Then the other specialist says, we call it the Sabbath. Their day of rest. I could not believe it until I saw it. A Hollywood blockbuster putting into the minds of everyone the aliens are the enemies of the world, the enemies of mankind. The only way we can attack is on, because every six days they're out working havoc on the world. But every seventh day they crawl back into their cage. It is what we call the Sabbath, their day of rest. On that day, that is the only day when we can unleash the truths to destroy them. Do you see how Hollywood is indoctrinating into everyone that the enemy is the one who rests on the Sabbath? Just to give you a little idea of how close we are to the end. Remember that we took a break from the series that we've been having, the dangers of the entertainment industry, but I thought I'd kind of shoot two birds with one stone, give you a reason, another reason why we should study the Word of God, because how close we are to the end, and at the same time, give you an example of what Hollywood is doing. Yes, folks, we are in the end of time. All right. I believe that concludes our why should we study the Bible. Now, when? When is the best time to study God's Word? Give me one second here. The tomorrow world. Just type in the tomorrow world, the Sabbath. You've got a lot of uh, people, Sabbath keepers, that are interviewing and, and doing research on this and expose. I just scratched the, the tip of the iceberg, okay? But it is unbelievable. Okay, um, sorry guys, we're having a technical difficulty. Just one second. Study God's word, amen? amen. Alright. When should we study it? Acts 
chapter 17, verse 11. They received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures when? Daily, folks. Daily. Matthew 6, 11 says, Give us this day our weekly bread. Give us this day our monthly bread. For some of us, give us this day our yearly bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Councils for the Church, page 87. If we would study the Bible diligently and prayerfully every day, we should every day see some new beautiful truth in a new, clear, and forcible light. Every day, folks. You see, the problem is, we read the Bible once in a blue moon. We'll read it once and then we'll read it again for two, three weeks. Then we'll read it again and we're wondering why we don't see anything happening. That's like saying, <laughs> you know, I don't get this whole food is good for you. You know, I ate yesterday and I'm not going to eat again for another two weeks. And then after that I'll wait another three weeks before I eat. Are we going to be able to see growth, nourishment in any way? No. It needs to be daily. Daily. When it's not daily, it reminds me of this, this guy that said, Man, do you believe it? I was training my horse. I was training my horse to live without eating. I was trying to train my horse to eat without, to live without eating. And he was going good. He was going good. And he almost mastered it. And then he died. <laughs> Folks, we need daily nourishment. When do we study God's Word? Proverbs 8, 17. Those that seek me, check this out. Those that seek me early shall find me. We're looking at when is the best time to study God's Word. Obviously, folks, any time is better than no time. But if we're looking for an ideal time, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, those that seek me early shall find me. Psalms chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee. We keep seeing biblical reference to spending time with God first thing in the morning. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. The Lord God, He waketh up morning by morning. He waketh my ear to hear as the Lord. So you see multiple biblical texts that let us know that the morning time is the best time to spend with God. Steps to Christ, page 70. Consecrate yourself to God in the morning. Make this your very first work. Steps to Christ, page 70. Oh, we got a problem. Because If we're not having to go to work, for most of us, what do the mornings look like? One of that sledgehammer? Folks, let me share something that should be eye-opening. Check this out. Spirit of Prophecy, John Gaddis, 2011, says, quote, How prevalent is the habit of turning day into night and night into day. Many sleep soundly in the morning when they should be up with the early singing birds and stirring when all nature is awake. Some are much opposed to order and discipline. They lie in bed some hours after daylight when everyone should be astir. They burn the midnight oil, depending upon artificial light 
to supply the place of the light that nature has provided at seasonable hours. In so doing, they not only waste precious opportunities, but cause additional expense. The precious habits of order are broken, and the moments thus idled away in the early morning set things out of course for the whole day. Is it just me, or can somebody else besides me seriously resonate with this? Has it ever happened to you that because you went to bed way too late the night before, you wake up the next morning so late that when you want to try to get some things done that day, before you know it, oh my God, look at this! Yeah, the sun's going to set so where did the day go? Look where the day went. The day went in the pillow. Now, have you guys ever experienced this? That you go to bed super early and you wake up the next day at 5, 6 in the morning. You wake up energized. You wake up well because you had a really good night's sleep. And by 10, 11 in the morning, you're shocked at how much you have accomplished in just the three, four hours that you've been awake. It's like, wow, I did so much more than I thought I would, and it's only 11 a.m. This is why the Lord says the best time to spend with Him is in the morning. Now, as to where where do we study God's Word? Well, that is a very difficult, complex question to answer. Where do we spend time with God? Right here. No, i Anywhere. Anywhere you can. Folks, it is ideal, yes, to wake up in the morning and to go to your little special place and your little you know, so with your little light, whatever. But folks, did you know that you can be spending time with God anywhere? You can be spending time with God, communicating with Him while you're driving, while you're walking down the street, while you're at work. You can just one sentence, two sentences, constantly be communicating with God. Anywhere, folks. He has got the ultimate wireless connection. Anywhere. Um, now, getting down to the last one, the crux of it. How? How do you study God's Word on your own? <clears throat> Folks, please know that how much you get from the Bible depends on how you see the Bible. For example, if you take a look at this beautiful site here, if we were to actually stand on this sand, and if, okay, we do this, we're all standing here, right here, how much of a beautiful, you see how beautiful this, this, this scene is here, but if we were standing here, how much of a beautiful sight would we get if we did this? Would we be able to capture this beauty? No. All we would see is some pebbles and gravel. In order to catch the beauty of it, you need to stand back and capture the entire picture. Same with something like this. Look at this beauty. But again, if we were to get super, 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 super close right here, just right here, you're not going to see much. You need to stand back and take a grasp and take it all in. Folks, many times people open up the Bible and take a look at one verse and try to make sense out of one verse by itself without looking at its context and looking at the much bigger and broader picture. 
Christ, our text lessons, page 110. Christ is the truth. His words are truth, and they have a deeper significance than appears on the surface. All the sayings of Christ have a value beyond their un beyond their unpretending appearance. Minds that are quickened by the Holy Spirit will discern the value of these sayings. Do you catch that, folks? All the sayings of Christ have a value way beyond what we can possibly imagine if we simply were to take the entire panorama in and not just look at one text by itself. Now, what must one do before studying the Bible? Because we're learning how to study the Bible. What is something that we must all do before? Well, let's take a look at Ezra, for example. Let's see if Ezra can help us out here. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Look at this. For Ezra had prepared his heart. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra was going to study the word of God, but what did he do before beginning to study? Well, the first thing is he prepared his heart. But he prepared his heart for what? To seek the law. But not only to seek the law, but to actually do it. Now, let's notice this process. Ezra prepared his heart. Personal preparation. How? How do we personally prepare the heart before studying the Word of God? Through prayer. And that, by the way, is what we're going to study. And it won't be two parts like this one was. It'll be only one part. But we're going to study the next time that I'm here how to diligently pray. How to have a successful, active life of prayer. To be able to get the most out of prayer. To be able to make sure our prayers are being heard. To be able to make sure that God is answering our prayer. All of that we're going to cover the next time that I'm here. But just please know for now that the way to prepare to study God's Word is through prayer. We cannot ever open up God's Word and expect for God to speak to us unless we first open up the airway and prepare the mind and heart to receive His Word. So Ezra had prepared his heart, but not only prepared his heart, but what? To seek the law of the Lord. So what is it that Ezra wanted to do? You must want to seek the law. Folks, do you know how many people, and this is what, okay, this is deep. I hope you guys get this. We're wondering why so few people really study God's Word on their own and get and get something out of it. A lot of people say, oh, I, I've tried to study God's Word on my own and, and I don't really get much out of it. What did Ezra do to prepare to study God's Word? To prepare his heart? The first thing he did is he is seeking the law of God. Do you know how many people in church Run from the law of God. They want to come to church to hear anything but the law of God. Tell me about how Jesus loves me. Tell me about how Jesus died on the cross for me. Tell me about how Jesus is my Savior. But don't tell me about how I need to change my life to obey His law. You know, everyone, I've said this before, everyone says, oh, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. But if we were going to be frank and honest, to many people, when they say, oh, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, we could honestly say, no, He's not. You don't want Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You just want Jesus as your Savior. Because, oh, saving me is good. If I'm falling, if I'm dying, save me. If God loves it. But wait, Lord? What does Lord mean? Lord means master. Lord means 
when, when someone is your Lord, they are your master, you obey them. So many times when people say, oh, I, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that just has a nice ring to it. But they don't really mean it. What they're really saying is, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Siempre cuando I can do whatever I want. I'll accept Jesus as my Savior as long as I can keep on living. Look, I'm going to say this again, even though I've said it many times before, but I know there's new people here. Something that just flows in every Christian church. Come as you are. Jesus accepts you as you are. Give me time for me. That is 100% true. God accepts you as you are. And in fact, the filthier you are, the more enrolado in sin you are, the more wretched and miserable and, and, and just down in the dumps you are, the more God will accept you. God will accept you as you are. That is a universal Christian slogan. However, there is an end to that that 99% of Christian churches don't like to say. And they don't. And that is that God, yes, accepts you as you are. But He is not going to keep you as you are. God will accept you as you are. But the moment He accepts you and you accept Him, you become a new creature in Him. And change begins. Jesus Christ becomes your Savior and your Lord. And that is why in John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. He does not say, If you love me, help all ladies cross the street. If you love me, pay your taxes. If you love me, honk. You see those little stickers out there? Honk if you love Jesus. No. If you love me, keep my commandments. Obey. Nothing means more to Christ than obedience. Remember, I gave you a clear example in Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. God gave the order to Cain and Abel to do a sacrifice and to bring the lamb. But I told you all many times that nowhere in the Bible does it say that Cain meant to be evil. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Cain said, Ooh, I'm going to on purpose be a rebel and turn my back against God. It is very possible that Cain could have said, Hey, you know what? It makes sense for Abel to bring a lamb. He's a shepherd. I am a tiller of the ground. I'm a gardener. I'm going to go ahead and bring God the best of what I have. Garden, you know, vegetables, fruits. If it were true, what most Christians today like to say, Oh, it doesn't matter how you worship, as long as you worship. If that were true, God would have accepted Cain's offering. But why did he reject it? Because obedience is what matters most to God. Amen. This is why in 1 Samuel 15, when King Saul came to Samuel and said, uh, I did most of what you asked, uh, but don't worry, well, we brought the best of the animals, but not for our personal gain, to bring them to church, to sacrifice them to God. Remember what was Samuel's response? Does God care more about sacrificing and worship than obedience to His Word? Then he continues on, Thus the Lord said, To obey is better than worship. A lot of people think that they're fulfilling. They're doing their duty. I showed up to church. I, but I did my time. I came to church. That means nothing. If your heart is not with God, as Him be not only your Savior, but your Lord, and that you are willing to obey Him in all that He has. But see, Ezra, to really be able to get the most of the study of God's Word, he prepared his heart, how? By seeking, not running from, but seeking the law of God. You know who else was a man after God's own heart? Who, was, who does the Bible say was a man after God's own heart? David. The Bible clearly says David was a man after God's own heart. You know why? Few people sought the law like David. Let me show you a few examples. Look at this. All of these are songs, 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 songs. So you can see David wrote them all. Look at the things that David would write. Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord and who in his law doth meditate day and night. 
I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. The law is my delight. Oh, how I love, I, I'm sorry, oh, how love I the law. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. The commandments are my delight. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. You know how many people talk like this? Very, 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 very few. David was able to spend enough time with God that David knew God well enough to know that the law was God's way of saying, I love you. And that's what so many people today do not catch. I've asked you guys this before. Many of you have heard it, but again, we've got new people here that have not heard it. What is, again, what is the number one thing, the number one word that a two-year-old hears from his mother? No. No, 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 put that down. No, no, touch that. No, no, put that in your mouth. No, no, go over there. No, no, do this. Anyone will agree that a two-year-old hears the word no more than anything. Now, if the two-year-old could talk, he would be like, man, you don't let me do anything. Anything I want to do. No, 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 no. You must really hate me. But what does anybody with two cents say? Oh, and I see that the kid doesn't realize that every time the mother says no, she's really saying, I love you. I'm saying no because I'm protecting you. You're just too small to see it. And then I ask the million dollar question. Where is there a bigger gap, folks, between the two-year-old's mind and the mother's mind or between our mind and God's? Where is the bigger gap? Obviously between us and God. But we all have no problem in saying, pobrecito, the little kid doesn't realize that his mom is only looking out for him. But yet we can all say, oh man, there's too many rules in the Bible. God doesn't allow this. God doesn't allow that. Could it be possible that God is telling us, I love you and that's why I give you my law. Amen. My law is protecting you. Amen. But because we can't see it, oh no, we're going to argue with God. We're going to fight God, and we're going to do what a two-year-old can't. We're going to turn our backs on God, and we're going to live the way we want to live. That really makes us look smart. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, but not just seek it, to what? Do it. Not just seek it, learn about it, preach about it, teach about it. Do it! Folks, an atheist can read and even study the Bible. Did you guys know that nobody knows the, the, the Bible better than Satan? Nobody knows the Bible better than Satan. But folks, doing it. James chapter 1 verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Acts 5, 32, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. You guys want the Holy Spirit? You know that the Holy Spirit is the only one that can help us understand God's word. You know that right before we open God's word and we pray, what are we praying for? We're praying for the Holy Ghost, for the Holy Spirit, to be able to help us to understand God's word. Well, guess what? Acts 5, 32 says God gives the Holy Spirit to only they that obey Him. Not my word, don't you the messenger. Acts 5, 32. And we are His witnesses of these things. And so also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey Him. So we must prepare our hearts by seeking the law and doing it. Is this clear? But then, once we prepare our hearts, once we seek the law and we're doing it, then what did Ezra do? Taught it! He actually taught that which what he learned. So we must seek the law, we must do it, and we must teach what we learn. Why do you think that so few 
are giving Bible studies? Why are so few people giving Bible studies? Because so few people are studying the Bible. Matthew 28, 19 makes our commission clear. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you. Amen. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we are to preach the word. Now, I want to talk for just a moment. We see here, preach the word. What does it say? Preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, what does this mean, folks? You realize that when we try to do this, when we try to reprove anybody, rebuke anybody, or exhort anybody with the, with the doctrine in hand, what's the typical answer that we get from people? Don't judge me. Oh, you're judging me. Folks, I have made this clear before, but I'm going to do it again. Because this cannot be said too often. Please do not confuse judging, with, which the Bible tells us we should not do, with what the Bible actually tells us to do. We just saw it. To reprove, rebuke, exhort. In other words, admonish. Folks, look at this. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Do you know what admonish means? To correct. To rebuke. To reprove. Luke 17.3 Watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins, warn them to stop. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. Are we getting a theme here? God encourages us and instructs us to admonish our fellow brothers and sisters when they are doing wrong. But when we do this, what do we get? Oh, you're judging me. Who are you to judge me? Only God can judge me. You've heard that one, right? Folks, please let me give you the biblical definition of what judging means. <clears throat> to judge means to, with your words, seal someone's eternal fate. When you tell somebody, oh, you're going to go to hell. Now that's judging. Because who are you to determine who is saved and who is lost? That is only God's department. You cannot tell someone, oh, you're so going to burn in hell for that, man. That's judgment. And the same way is to say, oh man, this person is so holy, I know they're going to be in heaven. They're, they're going straight to heaven. That is, look, you want to see the example? Matthew 12, 37. By your words, you will either, I'm sorry, you will be either judged innocent or condemned as guilty. Do you see it? What does it mean to judge? To say that someone is innocent or guilty. But please do not confuse that with brother or sister, what are you doing? You, you know better than that. The Bible says that we shouldn't do that. That is not judging, folks. That is admonishing, and God tells us to do that. So please don't get them twisted. Amen. Continuing on how. How do we study the God, God's Word? Okay, here it is. The tools that you should have ready at your fingertips when you are going to study the Word of God. Check this out. Now this is for ideal study of the Word. I understand that not every time you can have an ideal situation. But every time you can, you should, number one, have a dictionary with you. Because chances are, Especially if you're new to studying the Word of God, you're going to come across some words that you do not know the meaning of. And I don't know about you, but I am like most people that once I'm reading something, if I come across a word that I do not understand or know the meaning of, 
that I'm up. I, 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 don't, I don't pay attention to the rest the same. So having a dictionary very much helps. You should not only have a dictionary, but have a Bible dictionary. Did you know that those existed? There are Bible dictionaries that help you precisely to know the meaning of words in the Bible. You should have a Bible commentary. My SDA Bible commentary is available just for you to know. But a Bible commentary, basically it gives you a much even deeper look at all words and phrases that are found in the Bible. You should have a Bible concordance. The concordances that are one of the most popular, Cruden's, Young's, Strong. You know what a concordance is? If you want to, for example, know what a specific word in the Bible means, not just the dictionary definition, but how is it interpreted, how is it used, a concordance will give you where that word is found everywhere in the Bible, so you can get the huge panoramic view and not just be looking at the word by itself. Have access to several different versions of the Bible. And if you speak more than one language, Different languages will help even more. Now, a real quick comment on versions of the Bible. People have asked me, what is the best version? What version should I use? I want to tell you, this is not a study on the versions of the Bible, but please know that the King James Version is the oldest and original translation from the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts to English. If you want the original translation from the Greek and Hebrew manuscript to English, the best is the King James Version because it's the original. Now, what's interesting is that the King James Version has been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It is not in the last, until the last 100 years that all these other versions have come out. And within the last hundred years, now we've got almost 80 different versions of the Bible. You want to be careful. Because there are a few versions out there that heavily distort the original translation from the Greek and Hebrew to English. When I say distort, I'm talking completely using words that are not in the original. I'm talking about omitting certain texts, like it's text 1, text 2, text 4. What happened to text 3? It's gone. Some versions do that. And I'm going to tell you, one of the most dangerous versions that do a lot of this also happen to be one of the most popular versions. And that's the NIV. The New International Version. The NIV you want, see me after I will show you how the NIV literally omits verses of the Bible, skips verses, and will say completely different things than the original King James Version. Now right after the King James Version, the New King James Version, which is practically identical to the King James. But as time goes on, we've got ridiculous folks. Today, you know one of the latest versions? And I've said this before, one of the latest versions of the Bible, couldn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes, the Ghetto Bible. There's an actual version out there called the Ghetto Bible. Wherein, for example, if the Bible in the New Testament says, Jesus and his disciples came into the house to have supper, the Ghetto Bible would say, Jesus and, the, and his homeboys walked into the crib to get their grub on. That is blasphemy, folks. To bring God's word down to the ghetto? No, we need to bring the ghetto up to God's standards. But the fact that the King James Version is the original translation from the Greek and Hebrew manuscript, that does not mean that it will not hurt to check out a verse in other versions as well. But I always study with the King James. But once I've read the verse in the King James, then I don't mind checking it out in a few other versions just to get different ways of saying it. But I hold on to the original first. I will never study another version without the King James. Because I, you know, a lot of people don't want to do the King James because of the these and thou. No, I'd rather read with these and thou, but have the direct word of God than to have plain English of today, but be reading possibly something distorted. Amen. 
If you have not heard of this, BibleGateway.com is an awesome tool to be able to study the Bible. Because with Bible Gateway, you have every single version under the sun, in every language, at your fingertips. Beautiful for studying God's Word. This, by the way, is what it looks like, so that you have an idea, okay, of what Bible Gateway looks like. You should have a notebook and a binder with you to be able to take special notes. Now, today we're going a little bit over. I usually try to end at one. Hopefully, in another five minutes, we'll be done. Tools to have ready at your fingertips. Oh, also, the Conflict of the Ages series by the Spirit of Prophecy. We've got, you guys have heard of them, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, the Desire of Ages, the Acts of the Apostles, the Great Controversy. And again, if you have not studied diligently what God has to say regarding the Spirit of Prophecy, I don't expect anyone to believe this. You have to be taught by the Word of God what is the Spirit of Prophecy and what obligation do we have to believe in the Spirit of Prophecy. We'll see that when we get there. But for now, most of us have heard of these books. Well, when I was a kid growing up, I thought they were just books. But no, this right here, the Conflict of the Ages series, is the Bible, but way more in depth and in detail. For example, Patriarchs and Prophets covers from Genesis to Psalms. Prophets and Kings covers from Proverbs to Malachi. The Desire of Ages covers the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Acts of the Apostles covers from Acts to Jude. And the Great Controversy covers Daniel and Revelation. So you've got the whole Bible, but way more in depth in the Conflict of the Ages series. Now, here it is, the method of study, the formula. Here it is, to answer the question, how do I get the Bible to come alive in my living room by myself? How can I get the same thing by myself that I get in any given uh, conferencia, in any given crusade? First, select a short book of the Bible. If you want to start, if this is your beginning, to start studying the Bible on your own, select a short book of the Bible. When I say short, I mean ideally one with less than seven chapters. And here you have, I put a list here for you, of all the books in the Bible that are seven chapters or less. Okay? But here you go. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, all of these books, most of them New Testament, less than seven chapters. I personally, if you want, just my personal, I started studying the book of James. Beautiful book that we can apply into today's all of them you can apply to today's life, but I personally started with James, had a beautiful experience. But this, this is the thing. You select a short book of the Bible, ideally one with less than seven chapters. Then what do you do? Number one, study the entire book as a whole. First thing you do, you choose a time, whether it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever time you can, and you start studying, read the whole book. If you choose James, start with one, read the whole book, when you, which is seven chapters or less. You know, when I say the whole book, and we're not talking about a novel, okay? You should be able to read any of these books relatively quickly because they're less than seven chapters. You read the whole book. Now, when you're done reading the book, you're going to see that you probably didn't get much out of it. You got a few things, but you've only just begun. Once you study the entire book, number two, Read the chosen book seven times. Read the chosen book that you chose, not once, but seven times. Now, I don't mean just read it seven, one, two, three, four, five, no, no. Each time is going to be different. Check it out. Seven different ways. The first one, Read the Common English Bible version one time. You can find it on Bible Gateway. Once you have read, let's say you go with James, just as an example. If you choose James, you read James 
King James Version, original Greek and Hebrew manuscript, one time. Then the second time, read the book of James again, but this time read it from the common English version. Because it's common English, it's going to make more sense to you, but you already got the original into your mind and soul. Then, number two, read the new King James Version of the book. You read the book, but now, new King James Version. See, we're getting different versions reading the same book. Number three, read the King James Version once again. You read the King James Version of the book. Number four, read the book again, but very slowly this time, verse by verse. So that every time you read a verse, ask yourself, what did I get from this verse? Don't just be reading and reading and reading. Read the verse and at the end of every verse, stop and ask yourself, what do I feel the Lord told me in this one verse? I mean, look, Spirit of Prophecy, it goes just the same thing. Desire of Ages, page 390. We should take one verse and concentrate the mind on the task of ascertaining the thought which God has put in that verse for us. We should dwell upon the thought until it becomes our own. Dwell, focus on that one verse. Number five, read the book again, this time read it out loud. You are going to see that you are going to catch things, many things, reading it out loud that you did not catch when you were reading it in your mind. Number six, read the book fast. Now, skim through it. Read the whole book very quickly. And number seven, read the book backwards. Now, before anyone has a heart attack, I'm not talking about read it backwards like uh, the it went way. No, I'm not talking that backwards. I'm talking verse by verse by verse. You read the book, but starting with the last verse. Read the last verse. Then, el penultimo, the one right before the last. And you read the whole book, but going backwards, but of course not reading literally backwards. You're reading each text starting from the last, moving on. Am I explaining myself? You get it? Okay. Focus. Then, what do you do? You break down the book chapter by chapter. Remember I told you, have a notebook. Have a notepad with you. Once you have read the book seven times and done it in this fashion, then take your notepad and write chapter one and write down in your own words a breakdown of the first chapter. You're going to see, you're going to be amazed how you're going to be able to totally explain and write down everything that chapter one is about because you've read it seven times. Number three, read each chapter three times. Now you're reading chapter one, but instead when you're done chapter two, don't go to chapter two, read chapter one again. And chapter one a third time. You read each chapter three times. Once you have read the chapter three times, create a personal creative little title for the chapter. You know that the Bible, the chapters don't have titles. But what would be fun, what would be creative, is based on how many times you have read that chapter, create a title. Say, I think that what would be an awesome title for this chapter would be this. And the more you've read and know that chapter, the better title to be able to come up for B, summarize in writing in at least one paragraph what the chapter is about. C, end the written summary describing the essence of the chapter in one sentence. Once you've written down a summary of what the chapter is about, 
then finally conclude with one sentence that tells the entire chapter. Try to tell the whole chapter in one sentence. Now this sentence would be your answer if someone asked you, so what is the chapter about? If someone asked you, what's the chapter about? Boom, in a sentence you can answer it. And by the way, just FYI, two types of study methods. You've got contextual and comparative. And let me give you an example. Isaiah 28, 9 through 10. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? For precept must be upon precept. That's contextual. Line upon line, that's comparative. Here a little, there a little. So going first, contextual, getting the whole context and then line by line, which is comparative. And number four, create chapter divisions. Within the chapter, you choose where, okay, here I think would be a good divider because here it's talking about this, but now it kind of jumps a little bit to another subject, where you can choose yourself to create dividers within the chapter. And number five, create a Jeopardy type of game with as many questions as you possibly can, verse by verse. Now what do I mean by this? Check this out. Example, we all know John 3.16. If we were to read, for God so loved the world, and pay attention, hey, because I'm going to show you in just a second what it is to do the Jeopardy thing I'm talking about. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, how do you make a Jeopardy questionnaire out of that? Number one, who loved the world? God. What must we do to be saved? Believe in him. What did God give? His only begotten son. Who would be saved if they believe in Him? Whosoever. All. Those who do not perish receive what? Everlasting life. And what did God love? The world. You see, all these questions... Oh, one more. Who are the ones who will live forever? Those who believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you see? These questions, these seven questions, I just came up with them. These are seven questions that you can ask about John 3.16. So you see, you take the verse and you pretend that you're a teacher. And you have to give a quiz to your students on that verse. And you come up with as many questions as you can about that verse. Folks, do you see? It can take hours to fully understand and squeeze the juice out of just one verse. And yet, there are those who will read an entire chapter or book in just a few minutes. But do you see what is happening, folks? You are completely scrutinizing, analyzing, by the time you're done, you could spend a whole year studying the book of James, doing it in this fashion. And by the end, like I said, you will know the book of James better than most pastors. And when you learn something new, folks, this is what seals it, when you learn something new, share it three times. Neglect anything of a temporal nature, but be sure that the soul is fed with the bread of life. It is impossible, look at this, it is impossible to estimate the good results of one hour or even half an hour each day devoted in a cheerful social manner to the Word of God. Do you realize what God is telling us here? It's not possible. It is impossible to estimate how good it is to spend just one hour, even just 30 minutes with God every day. If you will seek the Lord and be converted every day, all your murmurings will be stilled. All your difficulties will be removed. All the perplexing problems that now confront you will be solved. All your stress goes away if you simply seek the Lord every day. Amen. 
I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Let this be our closing text so that we can be able to all say this once we've gone through the studying of God's word the way God intended it. Amen. Hopefully, everything that I've shared with you today and two weeks ago will give you a much better idea of how to study the Bible on your own. And I know I went relatively quick. Our time, look at this, as going as quickly as I did, we went quite a bit over today. But I trust that Brother Frank here has filmed this, and I believe at some point it will be on YouTube. So you'll be able to go to it, then you can pause, you can rewind, take notes. But this, folks, is an awesome, awesome, beautiful way to make the Bible come to life in your living room, in your bedroom, on your own, just you and God alone. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's close with our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. Please stand as we sing our closing hymn to close.